let me set the scene. You're going on a nice relaxing vacation to the beach, but you have three friends, Adam, Barry, and Chris, who are begging to go with you. Well, you could take none of them, one of them, two of them, or all three of them, and your friends are on pins and needles waiting to figure out what it's gonna be. Well, what is it gonna be? Well, to figure it out, we need the binomial distribution. But before we can figure out any type of probabilities, we first need to figure out how to count. Yeah, you heard me right, we gotta figure out how to count. We have to determine how many friends we're taking with us and how many different ways we could arrange those friends to actually go on vacation with us. Let's say that they've all been super annoying, so you decide to take none of them with you. How many different ways can you take none of your friends on vacation with you? It's not a trick question. In fact, it's actually quite simple. Just think about it for a second. How many different ways can you take no friends with you on vacation? One, that's it, exactly one. You take none of them. Well, they are your friends and you're feeling pretty charitable, so you decide to take one of them with you. How many different ways can you take one of your friends with you? Well, you could take only Adam, only Barry, or only Chris. That's it, three ways to take one of your friends with you. Now, what if you were to take two friends? This is where it can get a little bit trickier. You might be compelled to say six. You got three friends, two different of them are coming with you, three times two is six. Well, you'd be wrong. Let's write out a list of the possibilities. We have Adam and Barry, Adam and Chris, and Barry and Chris. See, grouping Barry and Adam is no different than having Adam and Barry. So here, order doesn't matter. So we have three ways to take two friends. Finally, you are feeling really, really generous and you decide to take all three friends with you on vacation. How many different ways can you take three friends out of three friends with you on vacation? Think about it, again, really, really simple. One, there's only one way. You take all of them. You take Adam, you take Barry, and you take Chris all together. That's the only one way that you could take all three friends. Now we have an amazing formula to cover situations just like this. If you have n friends and you want to count the number of possible groupings of x of them when order doesn't matter, the formula is this. Now it looks a little bit confusing, let's talk about it. First, that exclamation point is called a factorial. For example, six factorial would be six times five times four times three times two times one. That's what a factorial means. That's that exclamation point. And there's a little bit of a caveat there in that a zero factorial is equal to one because you go down to one, but zero is, well, one's above it. So that's why just mathematically we said zero factorial is one. Just deal with it. Now the term on the left is red, n choose x. It's a really new mathematical thing that you maybe have never seen before, but it's just a notation for choosing. N friends choose x of them. Now here are the answers to our vacation problems. Three friends choose zero of them, there's one possibility. Three friends choose one of them, there's three possibilities. Three friends choose two of them, there are three possibilities. And three friends choose three of them, there's only one possibility. Now don't worry a ton about the math for this, our calculator or some other program will do it for us. I just need you to understand the idea of it. Now let's look at this through the perspective of your friends, Adam, Barry, and Chris. Now they don't know if one of them or if any of them are gonna go on vacation of you, so because they don't know, they would like to quantify their uncertainty with probability. We are now entering a dimension where counting options meets probability. Now suppose based on some bad interactions during a street basketball game, your three friends determine that the probability you take any one of them is 15%. That means the probability you take Adam is 15% and independently of that, the probability you take Barry is 15% and independently of that is the probability you take Chris, which is also 15%. So the boys wanna figure out the probability of you taking one of them, two of them, three of them, or none of them. Let's start off with defining the probability of taking all three of them. That would be the probability that you take Adam and Barry and Chris. Now remember, in probability, that word and turns into multiply. So we have to find the probability we take Adam, multiply by the probability we take Barry, multiply by the probability we take Chris. That's easy, 0.15 times 0.15 times 0.15. 
The probability we take all three of them with us on vacation is very, very low at 0 0.003375 or only 0.3375%. So you're telling me there's a chance. So, sorry boys, pretty unlikely that all three of you are going to go. What about the probability of taking none? Okay, well that would be not taking Adam and not taking Barry and not taking Chris. Again, those ands are going to turn into multiplication. But what is the probability of not taking Adam? Well, remember, we already know the probability of taking Adam is 15%, so the complement or the opposite would be not taking Adam, which would be the 85%. And since the probability for each of your friends going on vacation with you is 15%, that's going to be 1 minus 0.15 for Adam, 1 minus 0.15 for Barry, times 1 minus 0.15 for Chris, or 0.85 times 0.85 times 0.85. That gives us an overall probability of 0.614 or 61.4% chance that you take none of them. So again, sorry guys, there's a pretty good chance that none of you get to go on vacation with. Now remember, in each of those scenarios, taking all three friends or taking none friends, there was only one possibility. That was it. We don't have to worry about switching it around because you could say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, if we're gonna take all three, what if we take Adam, Chris, and Barry? Well, wait a minute, that's the same thing as taking Adam, Barry, and Chris. Order doesn't matter. So each of those probabilities are already done for us because there's only one way they could each happen. What about the probability of taking just one friend? Well, one way that could happen is that we take Adam and not Barry and not Chris. That would be 0.15 for Adam times 1 minus 0.15 for Barry times another 1 minus 0.15 for Chris. But another possibility is that we take not Adam, we take Barry and not Chris. That would be 1 minus 0.15 for Adam, 0.15 for Barry, 1 minus 0.15 for Chris. Or the last possibility is that we take Chris, not Adam, and not Barry. That would be 1 minus 0.15 for Adam, another 1 minus 0.15 for Barry, and then finally 0.15 for Chris. Now, here's the deal. We already know that there were three different ways that you could take one friend, and all of those three different possibilities mathematically have the exact same probability because we have a 0.15 for the friend we're taking, and we have two 1 minus 0.15s for the other two friends we're not taking. So we don't need to do all that math three times, we only need to, need, we only need to do that math once and multiply it by three. Now that math work seemed a little bit complicated and took me a while to explain, so there's gotta be an easier way, and there certainly is. Recall we already know from our choosing formulas that there are three different ways to take just one friend. And since we already know the probability of taking one of those combinations, we just multiplied by the number of times we see it. So the three choose one tells us there's three different ways to take one friend out of three. Then we have a 0.15 for the one friend that's going with us. And then we have a one minus 0.15 and another one minus 0.15 for the two friends that are not. So the total probability that we take one friend with us is about 32.5%. We could have written the first situation, taking none of them, in the same format. Three choose zero friends, 0.15 to the zero, because there's nobody that's going, and then one minus 0.15 raised to the three, because all three friends are not going. That would give us our grand probability that we already determined, about 61.4%. Here's the probability for taking two friends. Three choose two, which we already know is three. We talked about that earlier. 0.15 to the second, because two friends are getting to go, times one minus 0.15 to the first. So 0.15 squared is for the two friends that are going. One minus 0.15 is the 0.85 for the one friend that's not. And there's three different ways that can happen. So we take three times that probability to get a total probability of about 5.7. 4%. And then finally, we have the option that we already talked about as well, three friends taking all three of them. This would be three choose three, 0.15 to the third for the three friends that are going, one minus 0.15 to the zero, since none are not going, and that gives us a total probability of 0 0.003375 that we saw earlier. Hopefully by now you see a pattern, and when you see a pattern, that means there's a formula. This is called the binomial formula.
But in general, x is the number of successes out of n trials. Everything behind the vertical line is information we know. P is the probability of success, and n is the number of trials or possibilities of success. So to find the probability of x successes, now which all depends on a given number of trials and a given probability of success, we use the formula n choose x times p raised to the x times 1 minus p raised to the n minus x. Now I break this down into three parts. The first part, n choose x, tells us how many possibilities we have for that particular option. Then we need x successes. p is the probability of success, so we have p raised to the x. And that means all other trials are, well, failures, which would be the opposite of success, hence 1 minus p. So if we have x successes, then the other n minus x must be failures. That's how the formula works. A little bit confusing, but once you start using it, it works really, really easily, and you'll get the hang of it really quickly, I promise. But don't forget, in order for us to use the binomial formula, we have to know three things are true. First, the definition of success must be given, as well as the probability of success, P. Second, the probability of success, P, must stay the same on every trial or opportunity, and each opportunity must be independent of the next. And third, the number of chances for success must stay a fixed value called n. And that's the binomial formula. Pretty easy. Now, at first glance, you might be like, ugh, what is that? But I think once you get the hang of it, it'll be pretty simple. And to be quite honest, as I'm going to teach you a little bit later on here, you're going to use technology to actually calculate these probabilities pretty quickly anyway. But I really need you to understand where they come from. Now, in the binomial formula, the x is known as a random variable. Random because we don't yet know what the outcome is, and variable because, well, those outcomes vary. Furthermore, it is a discrete random variable because those outcomes are listable and countable. Now, all discrete random variables have what we call a probability distribution. A probability distribution is simply a list of all of the outcomes for that random variable and each outcome's probability. For, for example, tossing a coin, the outcomes are tail or head. The probability of tail is 50%, the probability of head is 50%. So we can simply make a table listing tail and head and 50% next to each, or we can make a graph like this as well. Rolling a die is also a random variable. The outcomes are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And next to each outcome is its probability. The probability for each of those outcomes is the same at 1, 6 or 0.167. Again, we can make a table of those outcomes and their probabilities, or we can make a quick graph. Now, the reason why I bring up probability distributions is because we can make a probability distribution for a binomial situation as well, and then we could call it a binomial distribution. Now, a binomial distribution is exactly that. It's a list of all the outcomes and the probabilities for a binomial situation. So we could go back and take a look at our friend situation where we have three friends. How many of them are we going to take with us on vacation? Zero, one, two, or three. And then we already figured out the probabilities of each of those outcomes. So we can make a table showing those outcomes and the probabilities, or we can make a graph as we see right here. But what's really cool is in a binomial distribution, P runs the show. That's the probability of success. Now also N, the number of opportunities, also makes a big impact on the binomial distribution. But let's just assume for a second that we're going to leave that held constant at three friends. But let's just say that all of a sudden your friends have been super nice over the past year. So now instead of there being a 15% chance that you take any one of them, there's a 40% chance you take any one of them. So now we have a brand new binomial distribution for this new situation where the probability of success is 40% with three different opportunities. So again, we could take zero, one, two, or three friends. But now look, you can see how the probabilities of those different situations change because now success is 40%. We can see it in a table, or we can see it in a graph as well. Now, for example, let's figure out how I found the probability that we take two friends. First, we have three friends, and we're choosing two of them. Three choose two is three. Now, the probability of success is 40%, and we need two of those, because two of the friends are coming with us, so we need 0.4 squared. Now, that means one friend is not going with us, 
and the opposite of success would be failure, and 1 minus 0 0.40 would be 0 0.60, so we have 0.4 squared, and then 0.6 to the first. Two friends going, one friend not. For a total probability of 0.288 or 28.8%. Now, hopefully by now the formula is making sense to you and you're not panicking about it. But there's actually a lot of ways that we can use technology to help us calculate probabilities in a binomial distribution. One way is using your TI-84 calculator, and it's actually quite easy. The first thing you hit is second VARS on your calculator, which will take you to this menu, and you're going to scroll all the way down to binomial PDF. When you click on binomial PDF, it's going to look like this. Trials is N, how many different trials or opportunities you have, which we could set as three. P is the probability of success. In this current example, that's 0 0.40. And then X is, well, what particular value we want. In this particular case, we were looking at two friends going with us, so we could put a two there. Then all we got to do is hit paste, bring it to the home screen, hit enter one more time, and it calculates that probability for us. Once again, this is the probability that you have three friends and you take two of them, where the probability of any one friend going is 40%. Again, it gets us that answer of 0.2888 with really doing very little work. Now let's look at a whole new situation to see how well we're doing with this. How many football games will the Rootsville football team win this year? So X is our random variable, how many games they're going to win. Now to figure this out, we need to know a couple things. First, we need to know that the Rootsville football team will be playing 10 games this year. So they have 10 opportunities to win 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or all 10 games. Now we also need to know that the probability of winning any one game is independent of the next. I Meaning if they win or lose a game, it's not going to have any impact on what happens the next week. Now the last thing we need to figure out is the probability that the team wins any one single game. Now they do have a young quarterback and a very inexperienced coach, so let's just say the probability that they win any one game is 30%. We can use our T84 calculator or some other technology to easily create a probability distribution for this situation. We're not going to take the time to figure out the probability of every single one of them, but let's just dive into one. What is the probability that they win four games? Well, that means we need to look at three things. First, 10 choose four. How many different ways can they win four games? Meaning how many different ways, how many different scenarios will create four wins out of 10 games? Then we need to, well, win four of those games. So we need the success to happen in four of them. So it's going to be 0 0.30 raised to the fourth. And that means that the other six games are all failures, which is the opposite success of success is 30%. Failure would be 70%. So we have 0 0.70 raised to the 6. So once again, that's 10 choose 4. 0 0.30 raised to the 4th. 0 0.70 raised to the 6th. Or we could just use our ti 4 calculator to get us the answer really quickly. Once you determine the probability distribution, you could create a really nice graph like this that shows each outcome and its probability for the Rootsville football team. Now, one of the most natural questions in this scenario is what number of games is the Rootsville football team most likely to win? Now, if you have a probability distribution for the situation as a table or a graph, as we see here, that's actually a really easy question to answer. Just look, which outcome is most likely? We see three. Three wins is the most likely number of wins that the team will get this year. Now, in pre-computer classical statistics, this question was a little bit tougher to answer because creating a probability distribution like this wasn't so quick and easy to do. So back then the question was actually very similar but yet a little bit different. The more natural question is, how many wins do we expect the Rootsville football team to win this year? Slightly different question, but it's really important to understand it's an expectation. The expected value for a random variable x is viewed as the mean or the average value for that random variable if it were repeated a large number of times. Well, it turns out to find the expected value for a discrete random variable is really, really simple, and it's a quite easy formula. You simply take the sum of each outcome times its probability. So you take the first outcome times the probability of the first outcome, 
plus the second outcome times the probability of the second outcome, dot, 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 all the way to the last outcome times the probability of the last outcome. Add all that together to get your expected value. But it just so happens that there's an even easier formula for a binomial distribution. To find the expected value x for a binomial distribution, the formula is really, really simple. You simply take n times p. That's the set number of trials times the probability of success. For our situation, that would be 10 games times the probability of success, 0 0.30, and we get 3. But wait, isn't that the exact same answer we got when we looked at which outcome was most likely? Well, yes, but that's only in this situation where the probability of success is 0.3. But let's look at a different situation where we have a really good quarterback, a very experienced coach, and an experienced offensive defensive line, so experienced that the probability that they win any given game is 75%, a very big change. Now, if we were to look at a probability distribution for how many games that team could win, we would see that the most likely number of outcomes or the most likely number of wins is eight wins. However, when we use our formula to find the expected value, 10 times 0.75, we get 7.5 wins. Now, according to the rules of football, as far as I know them, you could only win a whole number of games, so you couldn't ever win 7.5 games. And that's okay, and that actually brings up what an expected value is. It is the average in the long run. So if we played out this scenario over and over and over again, the Rootsville football team plays 10 games, how many games do they win? They play 10 games, how many do they win? They play 10 games, how many do they win? Sometimes they win eight, sometimes they win seven, sometimes they win six, sometimes they win nine. If we repeat that process over and over again, in the long run, the average or the mean number of wins would be 7.5. So yes, a football team can only win seven or eight games, they can't win 7.5. But if we're looking at it as an average in the long run, it does make sense that the expected value would be 7.5. Now there's a second value related to the expected value that's also really important as well, called the variance. Now the formula to find the variance is a little bit trickier for a discrete random variable. You take each outcome, subtract the expected value, square that, multiply that by the probability of that value, and then do that for every single value. Take outcome minus the expectation squared multiplied by the probability of that outcome. A little bit confusing, I know. Then you gotta add them all together, but that is how you find variance. And then if you take the square root of the variance, you get something that we call the standard deviation. Now, good news is, for a discrete random variable, yes, that's a little bit tricky, but if it's a binomial random variable, it's not tricky at all. It's a really easy formula. To find the variance only in a binomial situation, you take n times p times one minus p, which would be the failure rate. Then to find the standard deviation, you simply take the square root of all of that. Now the purpose of the variance and the standard deviation is to give some type of precision to the expected value. Think about it as how well do we expect the expected value to actually occur? A high value for the standard deviation relative to the expected value simply implies that the expected value is, well, unprecise. Whereas a low value for standard deviation relative to the expected value tells us that the expected value is close to being on target. So for the Rootsville football team that is playing 10 games and has a 75% chance to win any one of those games, we see that the expected value is 7.5 wins and the standard deviation is 1.449 wins. Let's look at one more scenario for the Rootsville football team. Let's say that they have a really bad team this year and there's only a 10% chance that they're going to win any given game. Well, here would be the probability distribution for that football team. Now, since the probability of only winning any one game is 10%, we see that the most likely outcomes are going to be zero, one, or two wins, and getting seven, eight, nine, 10 wins is going to be, well, I hate to use the word impossible, but for lack of a better word, impossible for them to win that many games. 
But I do want to remind you that the probability of any contingent event is always in between 0 and 1, never equal to 0 and 1. So in a binomial distribution where we're contingent on the probability of success and a set number of trials, any outcome will never have a probability of 0 and any outcome will never have a probability of 1. The probabilities might be quite high, but they'll never be 1. The probabilities might be very, very, very low like we see here with the 10% chance football team, but no, you will never see a probability of zero. Now, when you look at a probability distribution, guess what? You could describe it, and you could describe it by talking about its shape, its center, the expected value or the mean, and the spread, the standard deviation. Now, we could do that for any one of these graphs, and we notice that we could be skewed right, we could be skewed left, we could be somewhat symmetric and mount shaped, but depending on what P is, you might get a different distribution. Now, another reason why I wanted to show you these three different pictures at three different levels of P is because, well, we don't know what P is. It could be 10%, it could be 75%, it could be 30%. We really don't know what the true probability that the Rootsville football team wins any one game is. But in order to figure out an expected value, we do need to have a certain probability of success given to us. Well, that's it for the binomial distribution. Hopefully you found it pretty easy. We got the binomial formula, and as long as you know how to use the binomial formula, you can create a binomial distribution showing the different outcomes and their probabilities. And with that, you could also calculate the expected value and their standard deviation for that specific binomial distribution. But please don't forget, the binomial distribution depends on two things, which is again why it's called the binomial distribution. We have to be given the probability of success P, and a set number of opportunities for success to occur, and that is called N. That's it, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Now, if you like learning from me, please check out my Ultimate Review Packet. It's got tons of study guides, review videos, practice sheets, and much, much more to make sure that you are ready for the AP Statistics exam in May. And if you're interested, you get a free trial. All you gotta do is visit the link in the description below. Enjoy, good luck, see you in the next video.